really consider the White House of the Confederacy the, the crown jewel of our collection. It is our largest artifact, certainly among our oldest, uh, dating back to 1818. And we, we are very fortunate to have so many wonderful stories about it, many of them coming from the first family of the Confederacy themselves. Um, and in fact, it was um, following the death of her husband in 1889 that the former first lady of the Confederacy, Mrs. Verena Davis, who, who often signed her, herself as Verena Jefferson Davis, um, came to, to support herself as a writer. This was uh, something that was very typical for uh, middle class and upper class women at that time. It was considered a very respectable kind of, of, of occupation. And um, she had gotten a, a bit of practice uh, helping her husband Jefferson Davis pen his autobiography. Which was, uh, which was finally published just one year after his death in 1890 as Jefferson Davis, a, a memoir. Um, but apparently she was known to have some, some literary talent uh, because a distant cousin of Jefferson Davis's, uh, a, a woman named Kate Davis Pulitzer, happened to be the wife of, of Joseph Pulitzer, a major, a, a major newspaper publisher, uh, actually asked Verena to begin writing some articles for her husband's newspaper, the New York World. And so in 1891, Mrs. Davis actually went on as a full-time writer for, for, that, for that publication. And she also moved to, to New York City. She'd often really enjoyed living in large cities and uh, following the death of her husband, uh, she felt a little bit more at liberty to leave Beauvoir down in Mississippi and travel up to New York City to uh, make it a little bit easier to pursue her, 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 her publications. Um, her youngest daughter, Winnie, also went with her, and the two women became something of, of literary women. Um, and, uh, and Winnie actually wrote several novels and Verena writing several different newspaper articles. So this is a, a painting of Verena from our collection that was uh, done in 1899. This would be just a few years after she penned an article that was published on December 13th, 1896 in New York World Magazine. And this was an article in which Verena described the last Christmas in the White House of the Confederacy. And this article really offers an unparalleled glimpse into the hardships faced by even the most politically powerful family in the Confederacy during the war. So I'm going to be reading lots of excerpts from her, her article. Um, it's not easy to find. There are some sections of it which have been published online. Uh, we, uh, we, of course, here at the museum have, have some copies of it in our research files. Um, so if any of you are really interested in tracking down a copy of the article, um, please see me afterward and I'll give you my email address um, so you can send me a, a quick follow-up and I'll, I'll, I'll send you a link to it online if you can't find it yourself. Um, but it is, it is really fun to go through and read through um, as a very kind of early Victorian Christmas celebration. And she gives us all of these wonderful nuggets of, of stories of things that happened within the White House of the Confederacy. And she opens the article by essentially saying that she's been looking through newspapers um, and seeing all of these advertisements for toys for children that, are, that just are night and day in, in, in terms of how children in the 1890s were, were celebrating Christmas versus how her own children in 1864 were, were celebrating Christmas. And, and she wrote, quote, that Christmas season was ushered in under the darkest clouds and everyone felt the cataclysm which impended, of course, probably the, the end of the war. But the rosy expectant faces of our little children were a constant reminder that self-sacrifice must be the personal offering of each mother of the family. So she's really seeing Christmas as a season to set aside whatever might be going on out in the wider world and focusing on making it a joyous event, especially for children. So that's something I think that's very much in keeping with, with how, how we continue to celebrate the holidays today. Well, then as now, food was always a very important part of, of the holiday celebrations. And the hardships by 1864 were certainly taking their toll on the first family of the Confederacy. Verena wrote that there were, quote, no currants, raisins, or other ingredients to fill the old Virginia recipe for mince pie, and the children considered that at least a slice of that much, co of, of that much coveted dainty was their right, and the price of, of indigestion paid for it was a debt of honor. <laughs> now, she did note 
that they managed to secure a bottle of brandy for $100 and that, quote, apple trees grew and bore in, in spite of war's alarms, so the foundation of the mixture was much assured. The many exquisite housekeepers in Richmond had preserved all the fruits attainable, and these were substituted for time-honored raisins and currants. So this is a sense of ersatz mince pie. And uh, in the days and weeks leading up to um, leading up to Christmas, Verena wrote that there was essentially a citywide food drive for the poor in which those who were better off um, would send food usually to her so that she could then go and, 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 and distribute it. Uh, the types of food that was often collected were, were kind of non-perishable items like salted meat, rice, flour, and molasses. So still very much a sense of helping those who, who, who are less fortunate during the holidays. By Christmas Eve, um, Mrs. Davis reported that, quote, about 20 men and girls gathered around small tables in one of the dining rooms of the mansion and began making decorations for the Christmas tree, end quote. And then she goes on and describes the various decorations which they make. She spends some time describing the little cornucopias which they made. They were trying to come up with some kind of little, um, a cornucopia is kind of a horn of plenty. We often see them at Thanksgiving as kind of those horn-shaped baskets with fruit and other good things kind of spilling out of them. And they were popular at this time as in a miniature form with, with candy. Um, and so uh, they were trying to make some kind of little basket thing in, in, into which they could place some, some, some candies and other treats. Um, other tree decorations included stringing apples and popcorn and hanging them on the tree. So lots of good edible things. Uh, they also had a local person who managed to, to, uh, to make some little miniature uh, wax candles to be able to place on, on the tree. And by 1864, wax would have become fairly scarce for ordinary citizens, so that probably would have taken some doing. Now, if mince pie was considered necessary for the children, then the household slaves insisted that eggnog made, made it a holiday. Quote, even if it's only a, a little wine glass, for I don't know how we're going to get along without any eggnog, end quote. And Verena met this challenge very gallantly by securing eggs and liquor and managed to send a bowl of eggnog to, to the uh, servants and slaves on, on Christmas Eve, along with, quote, part of everything which, which they coveted of, of the dainties. So there's a sense of sharing some part of the larger feast with, with the household staff. And um, in the White House of the Confederacy, they had an interesting mixture of both enslaved African Americans, free people of color, and white European immigrants. And quote, um, in most of the houses in, in Richmond, these same scenes were, were all enacted, uh, certainly in, in, in every one of the homes of the managers of the Episcopalian orphanage. End quote. And this Episcopalian orphanage is something that becomes kind of a focal point of the Davis's Christmas, so we'll, we'll keep coming back to that. Quote, at last quiet settled on the household, and the other members of the family began to stuff stockings with molasses, candy, red apples, oranges, paper dolls, balls made of worsted rags wound hard and covered with old kid gloves, a pair of pretty woolen gloves for each child, either cut out of cloth and embroidered on the back or knitted by some deft hand out of homespun wool. For the president, there were a pair of chamois skin writing gauntlets exquisitely embroidered on the back with his monogram in red and white silk, made, as the giver wrote, under the guns of Fortress Monroe late at night for fear of discovery, as well as a handkerchief and loving letters written by, by each of, of, uh, of his children. So really, we're talking wonderful homemade gifts, simple things that people can use that have some kind of often emotional tie-in that's going to, 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 to really remind you of the person who, who made it for you. On Christmas morning, the children awoke early and came in to, to see their toys. They were followed by the Negro women, who one after another caught us by wishing us a, a very Merry Christmas be, before we could say it to them, which gave them a right to a gift. Of course, there was a present for everyone, small though it might be, and one who had been born and brought up on our plantation was vocal in her admiration of a gay handkerchief, end quote. So Verena is painting a picture not only of herself, her husband, and the children, 
but also all of the household servants and slaves coming together. And when she mentions this, you know, catching you, it's kind of like trick or treat. Um, on Christmas Day back then, if you were, you know, passing in the street and you saw someone you knew and you said Christmas gift, then they were obligated to, 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 to give you a little something. Um, as far as her own gifts, Verena reported getting six cakes of soap made with, quote, the grease of ham boiled for a family down in Farmville, <laughs> a skein of, of, of gray linens spun at home, quote, a pin cushion of some plain brown cotton material made by some poor woman and stuffed with, with wool from her pet sheep, end quote, a baby hat which had been made by some of the orphans for her, 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 um, her, her little baby, quote, a fine, delicate little baby frock without an inch of lace or em embroidery upon it, but with the delicate fabric set with fairy stitches by a dear, a dear sick neighbor who made it, and it was very precious in my eyes, end quote, a thimble and sheet music bound in wallpaper. So these are all homemade items, very simple things, and yet she's really treasuring them very much. We're fortunate to actually have a few items in our collection made by, by Mrs. Davis, um, and particularly the one here on the left was a, a Christmas gift to one of her neighbors during the very last Christmas here in the White House. Um, this is an item that is probably not familiar to most of us today, um, but back then these were, th these were more common. It's called a knitting needle sheath, and I have to admit I don't knit, but I've been told that the way that these were intended to be used What you would do is if you were sitting down and knitting, you could put a knitting needle into this quill and kind of have this kind of sitting either pinned at, at your waist or something, and it'll essentially hold the one needle still while you actually knit with the other one so that it kind of frees up one of your hands. Now again, I'm not a knitter. I don't know how well this would work, but presumably it was supposed to free up one of your hands to make it a little bit easier to do other things. Uh, we know that Mrs. Davis was very fond of butterflies, that she um, often had them painted on her china. She made two quilts, and one of them had butterflies featured on it. Um, so it's not that surprising to see this uh, very, very utilitarian item decorated with this lovely stitching and embroidery on velvet to make this, this very nice little butterfly ornament. Um, and next to it is a front and back photo of a little velvet uh, scissors case that she made for President Davis. We don't know if that one in particular was a Christmas gift, um, but very typical of the types of practical gifts which, which they would have been giving one another. After the family ate breakfast on Christmas morning, uh, they walked over to St. Paul's Church. And Mrs. Davis says that they often preferred to walk rather than take the carriage uh, because it seemed more, more, more proper and that, quote, the saintly Dr. Minnegarode preached a sermon on Christian love, end quote. And then they, they proceeded to, to listen to some, some young ladies uh, singing various hymns. Um, the family seems to have returned back to the White House of the Confederacy, which really isn't that far from, from the church, and they proceeded to have a large Christmas Day dinner, which consisted of turkey, roast beef, and for dessert, a special treat for the children, a spun sugar hen sitting on a nest full of blanc mange eggs. Now I had to look up what blanc mange is. It sounded really lovely. It's a ba basically the cream filling that it, that's in a cannoli. So it's that kind of fluffy white stuff. Um, they finished it all off with more mince pie and plum pudding. So I have to say this Christmas Day dinner sounds far beyond the means of what would have been available to most ordinary Confederates during that period. Now the highlight of the day, however, was the children's tree back at, at, back at, at, at St. Paul's Church. Um, Verena writes that just a few days before Christmas, quote, the news had come like a clap of thunder out of a clear sky that the orphans at the Episcopalian home had been promised a Christmas tree and the toys, candy, and cakes must, be, must all be provided as well as one pretty prize for the most orderly girl among the orphans, end quote. So this sent the ladies of Richmond into a positive frenzy as they scrounge about trying to quickly throw together a Christmas tree with all of these gifts for the orphans and, and a very special gift. 
So they contacted a local confectioner who was enlisted to make some very simple candies. No cornucopias or sugared fruits, but maybe some, some, some kind of, of, of molasses or, or other things. And in the meantime, Richmond ladies began to look through their, their, their old children's toys to find broken ones, which were easily repaired. Quote, eyeless dolls, three-legged horses, tops with the upper peg broken off, rubber tops, monkeys with, monkeys with all of the squeak gone silent, and all the ruck of children's toys that gather in a nursery closet, end quote. So it kind of brings to mind to me anyway, the island of misfit toys. You kind of have all, all of these, these, these poor broken toys which they're going to gather together, fix up as best they can, and then re-gift to these orphans. <coughs> as for the special gift for the best behaved uh, girl, um, they turned that particular task over to Robert Brown, who was a African American uh, slave who was working in the White House of the Confederacy as kind of as the uh, butler or manservant. Um, he was noted for being, you know, a, a, a very, um, a very strong, silent sort of fellow, and he took on th this task with great seriousness and decided to make a lovely dollhouse. And so he he proceeded to fa to, to to fashion a four-room dollhouse while the ladies of Richmond made all of the furniture and furnishings for it. Um, using either um, broken doll furniture or, or even making things out of twigs and paste uh, and pasteboard and making little uh, pillows and pillowcases and sheets and, and, and things like that as well. And apparently all day the children at the Episcopalian home were, were waiting with great impatience to be able to finally go and, and open all of their gifts. Mrs. Davis wrote that, quote, all through the afternoon, first one little head and then another popped in the door and asked, isn't it eight o'clock yet? Burning with great impatience to go and see the children's tree. And quote, when at last we reached the basement of St. Paul's Church, the tree burst upon their view like the realization of, of Prince Aladdin's subterranean orchard, and they were awed by its grandeur. The orphans sat mute with, with various degrees of astonishment until the opening hymn and prayer and the last amen had been said and then they at a signal warily and slowly f f gathered around the tree to receive from a lovely young girl their allotted gifts the different gradations from joy to ecstasy which shone upon their faces was worth two full years of peaceful life just to see the president president davis of course became so enthusiastic that he undertook to help in, in the distribution of gifts, but worked in such wild confusion, giving everything asked for into their outstretched hands, that we called a halt so that he contented himself with unwinding one or two tots from a network of strung popcorn in which they had become entangled, and taking off all the apples which he could, when unobserved, and presenting them to the smaller children." End quote. So that's a, that's, um, a, a a, a bit of a long uh, entry there, but I think it paints this wonderful image of President Davis playing Santa Claus, you know, taking these gifts off of the tree and handing them out to the children. Um, I'll digress briefly and say that um, um, Minigerode, who was the pastor at, at St. Paul's, was a German immigrant. Um, and in fact, he's often thought to be the individual who first brought the the, the tradition of the, of the Christmas tree here to Virginia. Uh, he, was first, uh, he was first a pastor at a church down in Williamsburg, which is where he's first thought to have brought that, that particular practice, probably in the 1840s. Um, and so by the time of the Civil War, when he's at St. Paul's here in Richmond, you have a lot of kind of upper crust people who had previously, you know, maybe 20, 30 years before, had not heard of a Christmas tree. But now that Queen Victoria in England is married to a German prince and they've got a Christmas tree there, this kind of percolating all, all throughout society. Um, so the Davises probably first brought the custom of a Christmas tree into their own home, perhaps after, uh, after seeing it at, at, uh, at St. Paul's. And we know that typically these Christmas trees are not kind of the full height trees which most of us have in our homes today. Um, they were often tabletop trees. Um, so in some of the slides which I've shown throughout, which um, have, have shown images of the White House of the Confederacy, they were mostly tabletop trees. We don't know what size tree it was at, uh, at, uh, at St. Paul's for the orphans, because it sounds like there were a good number of children. You might suspect it was a larger tree to be able to hold all of the gifts, but 
We simply don't know. We do know, however, that when the prize dollhouse was finally given to the lucky little orphan girl who, who had won that, that, quote, she moved her lips without emitting a sound, but held it close to her breast and went off in a corner to look and be glad without witnesses, end quote. So it must have been a very, very special toy for her indeed. Well, that evening, uh, after, after giving all of the gifts to the orphans, um, Verena and Jefferson Davis brought, brought their children back home, um, and then they headed to a, a neighbor's home for a, quote, starvation party. And those of you who know, who know starvation parties, were, uh, they became increasingly popular throughout the war as a response to hardships and shortages, because people could no longer afford to have the, the traditional parties with lots of food and punch and liquor and all of those things. So they started having parties where they might serve a bowl of water you know, with punch glasses and everything, all, all, all still there, uh, but perhaps now you don't have any food or maybe just very, very small snacks. Um, so you're going more for the social interaction and less for the food and the drink. Um, so they, um, they, they were celebrating, as, as she reported, with, with no refreshments, dim lighting, and music played on a solitary piano. She did say that there were plenty of young Richmond ladies dressed in finery and officers uh, who, who had ridden in from the areas around Richmond, um, changing in, into their, their fine dress uniforms, of course, so that they could dance with, with, with all of those young ladies. And it was only after the party ha had concluded and Jefferson and Verena had returned to the White House that they received word that they had missed a visitor that evening, that General Robert E. Lee had come to call and uh, that he'd left word that he'd mistakenly received a barrel of sweet potatoes, which had been meant for the Davises, and he ate one serving and shared the rest with his soldiers before realizing that they'd been intended for the Davises. So he was coming to apologize, and of course, Verena um, absolutely was, was, was fine with that and, and, and wrote, quote, we wished it, it, it had been much more for them and him. She concludes her article by saying, so in the interchange of the courtesies and charities of life to which we could not add its comforts and pleasures passed the last Christmas in the Confederate mansion. The photograph we have here was taken um, just a few years before her death. You have Verena seated there in the middle. Um, to her right is her eldest daughter, Margaret. The woman standing is her granddaughter. And then the baby, of course, is her great granddaughter. Um, so there were many more generations of, of Davises who were around. Of course, they were not celebrating Christmas in the White House, um, but I can only imagine um, if any of those grandchildren or great-grandchildren ever really wanted something for Christmas, the stories that she must have told them about, you know, really wanting and behaving and the hardships that she put up with, you know, back, back in the war years. Um, but as far as I know, this article um, is the only description of, in, in this level of, of degree of any holiday celebrated in the White House, and indeed might, might be the, the longest narrative written by someone who lived in the White House of the Confederacy about life during the war. So um, I do hope that you are encouraged to go and try to find the text online and that you've learned something today about Christmas in the White House during the Civil War. Thank you. Questions? Yes, sir. It is not very long. Um, I would probably take you about 15 minutes to read, if that. Um, it, it doesn't really go in order exactly. It kind of jumps around a little bit. Um, the, the version that I have is kind of an old reprint. It's about six single-spaced pages, but it's very kind of large print on that. So, any other questions? I think it probably was an accident. I mean, I, I could see a barrel getting delivered, and maybe you don't read the note first, and you're hungry, and it's Christmas, so you go ahead and pass them out. But uh, I do think it would be, from what I know of General Lee, it would be very much in keeping with his character to come all the way to the White House to apologize to President Davis for something that, of course, I'm sure he would have been absolutely fine with. <laughs> well, thank you.
you all so much. Um, the White House will be decorated for the holidays through about the first week of January or so. So if you didn't have a chance to go through last weekend on Corda and Christmas when, when it was open uh, and, and free of charge, we hope that you'll have a chance to go through and, and see some of our, our tabletop trees and other Victorian decorations before the, the end of the holiday season. And Merry Christmas to you all.